Well, good morning. It is good to see each and every one of you here this morning. You know, all of us have little pet peeves, you know, kind of things that, that drive us crazy. Um, I'm going to share with you one thing that drives Heather crazy, and, and, and it's okay because it's about me, so I, I can share this. She hates it when, well, hate is a strong word, but she does. She hates it when I put something in the microwave and warm it up, like if I'm going to warm up uh, leftovers or, you know, lunch or something like that, and then I get distracted, I am busy doing other things, and I leave it there, and then after 30 minutes, what do you think I have to do? Reheat it. And then after 30 minutes again, what do I have to do? Reheat it. She hates that. You know, uh, when you warm it up, why don't you just eat, eat it right, right then and there? Because everyone who is experienced with the microwave knows that when you heat, or with an oven or with the stove, when you heat food up and it just sits there, what will happen with that food? It gets cold. Now, there's a scientific reason why that happens, and it is called the second law of thermodynamics. How many of you knew that? The second law of thermodynamics. I see one hand. Now, how many of you are saying, I didn't know I was going to be in a science lesson this morning? Now, you see, the second law of thermodynamics, it's a big fancy word, and I'm not going to go into all the details of it, but basically what it says is that any system, anything, will eventually come to a state of equalness. Because when you have hot food and, you, and it's surrounded by cold air, then what, if you leave it out long enough, what will happen with the temperature of the food and the temperature of the air around it? It will become equal. Um, so all those molecules in the hot food that's bouncing around will finally come to an equal state with all the slower molecules ar ar around it. And so any, any state that's not receiving any new energy. Now what happens with your food if you, uh, if you keep it on the stove? Will it go cold? No. What happens with your food if you keep it in an oven that's on? Will it grow cold? No, it will eventually burn. Um, uh, you know, what happens if you keep warming up, you know, of course it will stay hot. So if it's not receiving the energy, if it's not receiving something, then it will eventually find itself even with the world around it. And you know what? That same scientific principle is true in our spiritual life as well. Keep in mind, God created this world, and when he created it, he gave it all of the scientific laws. Why do we have the law of gravity? Because God designed the world that way. Why is there that, law of, uh, that second law of thermodynamics? Because God designed it that way. And one thing that I find about God is what he puts in the world often reflects what's true in all aspects of life, including your spiritual life. So let me ask you this. What happens to a Christian or to a, a, a family or to a church if it's not receiving the energy of the Holy Spirit, and it's not growing in its walk in faith in Christ, then what happens to that, to that person or that family or church compared to the world around it? It becomes just like the world around it. Second law of thermodynamics. So those of you who are in, who, who are in school, uh, you can pull that one to your science teachers and, and see what they say. Um, but we, we see this all throughout history. Uh, we, we see it uh, with, uh, when we look in the Bible, we see it time and time again with God's people, whether we're in the Old or New Testament. If they're not following God, if they're not growing in him, if they're not receiving his power and his presence, then they grow cold and they grow just like the world around it. If you have your Bible, I want you to open up to Ezra chapter 7. We have been journeying through the book of Ezra on this, uh, in, in the sermon series that we're calling Build, because the Israelites, they had returned to Jerusalem after they had been in exile, and they had been building the temple of God, and, and we've been journeying with them through this time. Cyrus was the ruler of the Persian world who allowed the Israelites to return to their land, which was destroyed by Babylon uh, nearly 60 years before. He allowed them to return so they could build the temple of God. And we saw them, how they came and how they built the altar, how they started building the temple, when because of obstacles outward and inward, they stopped building for several years until 
God raised up a couple prophets, Zechariah and Haggai, to encourage the people to start building once again. And, and they responded faithfully to that. And, and we were with them as they completed the building of the temple. And when they built it, they dedicated the temple and they worshiped God. And it was a great time. Now, um, I don't know if any of you have been wondering why the book is called Ezra when through the first six chapters have we come across anyone named Ezra? No. Well, chapter 7, Ezra comes on the scene. Chapter 7 happens about 58 years after chapter 6. So there's a gap in there. Uh, Cyrus is no longer the ruler of the Persian kingdom. During that, uh, during that nearly 60-year gap, Xerxes became the ruler of Persia. And if you're familiar with the book of Esther, Esther takes place between chapter 6 and chapter 7. Uh, the people of Israel, while some of them are, are, are now back in Jerusalem in the Promised Land, many of them are still living uh, throughout the kingdom of Persia, like Esther is. There's a threat against God's people, and uh, there's a plot to destroy all the Jews, but God was faithful to his people. And if you're familiar with the book of Esther, you see how God placed her there at such a time as this to save uh, God's chosen people. Well, Xerxes came and Xerxes go, and now the ruler of the uh, Persian Empire is a, ne- is a man by the name of Artaxerxes, uh, Xerxes' own son. And so chapter 7, Ezra is uh, living in the land of Persia uh, with, Zer- with Artaxerxes ruling the land. And uh, the, those who are living in Israel, the temple has been completed now for nearly 60 years. 60 years... After building, what tends to happen with excitement? When that whole building process is going on, there's excitement, there's vision for how it's going to be done. Uh, Tommy, I know many times we've talked about the physical building of Central here and just the wonderful time that was and the energies, but when a project is completed and time goes on, what what generally happens to the energy, to the passion, to the excitement? It begins to wane, and it begins to die. So after these 60 years, we, we will find that the excitement of the building has faded, and commitment to God's word and God's vision has grown lax. And so we come to Ezra. Let's read together, if you have your Bible, in chapter 7, starting in the first verse. After these events, during the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia of Ezra... Sariah's son, Azariah's son, Hilkiah's son, Shalom's son, Zadok's son, Ahatub's son, Amariah's son, Azariah's son, Mariah's son, Zerhariah's son, Uzi's son, Buki's son, Abishua's son, Phineas's son, Eleazar's son, Aaron, the chief priest's son, Ezra came up from Babylon. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. The king had granted him everything he requested because the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Some of the Israelites, priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, and temple servants accompanied him to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month during the seventh year of the king. He began the journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month and arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. The gracious hand of God was on him because Ezra had determined in his heart to study the law of the Lord, obey it, and teach its statutes and ordinances in Israel. May God bless the reading of his word. So when we look at Ezra, Ezra is a priest. When it talks about him being the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, it all went back to Aaron, who was the first priest that God appointed in Scripture. Ezra is a priest, and that means that he has spiritual authority that God has given him, for the priesthood was carried through the heritage from Aaron, his sons, and on down and on down. But not only was Ezra a priest, he was also a scribe, which is one of the first instances we see in in Scripture. Before now, any time you've seen the word scribe, it generally just meant 
a recorder of, uh, of a kingdom. Uh, so basically more, just like a secretary. But when it comes to God's people, a scribe is more than just a secretary. Because a scribe was one, yes, who recorded the scripture and rewrote it so that others could, uh, could have it. But, he was, but a scribe was also one who was familiar with scripture, was able to interpret it, and was able to teach it well. And as it tells us about Ezra there in chapter 6, it says that he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses. And that word skilled means he was a professional. He knew God's word thoroughly, and he knew how to apply it. So not only did he have spiritual authority, but in a sense, he also had professional authority. But he also was authorized by King Artaxerxes. It says that Artaxerxes granted him his every request. Now here are these first 10 verses that we're just looking at this morning is a general summary of what's going to happen. Over the next few weeks as we walk through the rest of chapter 7 and chapter 8, we're going to see why Ezra is returning to Jerusalem and what specifically King Artaxerxes is, is granting him as his request. But Ezra's concern was for Israel. Yes, the temple has been uh, completed several years ago. Yes, the sacrificial system is going on, but there's an impression that it seems that there's been a lack of the teaching of God's word. And when God's word is not being poured into the hearts of people, then what happens according to that second law of thermodynamics? The excitement, the passion, the commitment to God grows stale and cool. And so Ezra desired to go, as it says here at the end of chapter 10, because he determined in his heart to study the law of the Lord, obey it, and teach it. So he was a priest who had spiritual authority. He was a scribe who had professional authority. And he was also authorized by King Artaxerxes in journeying to Israel. So he had civic authority. And as he went, he journeyed to Babylon, from Babylon to Jerusalem, a four-month journey that would take nearly 900 miles The same journey that at the beginning of the book of Ezra, those who were first allowed by Cyrus to return, that same journey now that he is going over nearly 60 years later. And like those who who went before him 60 years ago to first start building the temple, Ezra doesn't go by himself. It mentions that he goes with uh, other Israelites, priests, Levites, singers, gatekeepers, temple servants. So it's almost a repeat of what happened 60 years before. Why did the people return six years before? Because they were going to build the temple. Why is Ezra going now six years later? Because there's renovation that needs to be done. Not renovation with the physical temple of God, but spiritual renovation with the people of God. And we who are Christians who follow God, there are various times in our life where we can look at our life and evaluate our spiritual walk with God. We can look at our families and see where our families are at. We can look at our church and see where our church is at. And there are times where we can recognize and say, yes, there's some renovation that needs to be done. And when it comes to building the kingdom of God, does it ever stop while we're on this earth? Does it ever stop while we're on this earth? No. And so the building needs to continue. The renovations need to continue. And so the question I want to ask is, how can you renovate your life? How can you renovate your family? How can we renovate our church and continue to build the kingdom of God that God has given us that task to do? Well, as we look at Ezra in this summary verses here in chapter 10, there's a couple things that I want us to see when it comes to renovating, when it comes to building. And the first one is this. We need to hold God's word in our heart. You need to hold God's word in your heart. For the most important verse is there in chapter 10 when it explains Ezra's passion his driving force, what, was, what, what his commitment was, what his purpose was. Chapter 10, because Ezra had determined in his heart to study the law of the Lord, obey it, and teach its statutes and ordinances in Israel. Ezra was determined in his heart. To be determined in his heart, literally it means to be upright. It's like if you take a pole or a fence post and you plant it firmly in the ground to where it can withstand the elements uh, of nature around it. If you get a building or, or a fence post that is just kind of 
sitting a little bit in the ground, what happens when a gust of wind comes? It gets knocked over. But when you have something that is firmly planted, when a strong force comes, it will stand firm. Uh, The same is true with trees. How many of you have ever seen a huge, large tree that when a windstorm came, landed on its side? How many of you have ever had a house that's been hit by a tree that, 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 that's fallen over? Right. Why did it not stand? It was a massive tree. It was huge. It looked strong. Indeed, if you went up and you tried to hit it with as hard as you could, you're probably doing more damage to yourself than that tree. So what caused it to fall? Obviously, it was not rooted firmly in the ground. But but a tree that withstands even hurricane force wind is because it is rooted firmly. The same is true with a building. When you're building a building, if you don't have a solid foundation, then what happens? You know, it's like the parable that Jesus told at the end of the Sermon on the Mount about those who decided to build. One decided to build on, on, on sand. And what happened when the storm came? Washed it away. The one who decided to build on rock, what happened when the storm came? It stood. And what did Jesus say? The one who builds on the rock is the one who hears my word and lives it out. Who builds his life on on my word. And here we have Ezra who was committed to the very word of God. His heart was planted on God's word. And when your heart is planted in God's word, when your life is firmly planted in the word of God, when your family is planted on the word and when our church is planted on the word, then what will happen when the storms of the world assail us? Psalm 119, verse 10 and 11 tell us this. I have sought you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have treasured your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. You know, that that last verse, verse 11, is quoted very often. I've hidden your word, I've treasured your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. But that first verse, I love you with all my heart. Don't let me wander from from your commands. Because if your word keeps me from sinning, then how does it do so? When I'm not wandering, but when I'm firmly planted in your word. You know, we live in a day and age where people are no longer firmly planted in the word of God. They treat the Word of God like a buffet table, taking what they like, leaving what they don't like. They take the Word of God as good advice, but you don't necessarily need it to live a purpose-filled life. We have people who treat the Word of God as just fairy tales and fairy stories. We have people who treat the Word of God as just good principles for living, but that's merely it. But God's word is not any of those. It's living and active. It's the very word of God. God created this world by his word. John 1.1 tells us that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and took up residence among us, as Jesus himself is the word of God. And he has given us his word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, which can pierce to our very soul. His word, which is sufficient for all of life and knowledge, of salvation. And when you plant yourself on God's word, it will hold you firm. Because God's word will never disappoint. It will never fail away. You know, throughout history, there have been people time and time again that have tried to disprove God's word. And you know how many one of them have disproven God's word? Zero. In fact, you'll discover that a good number of those who make it their life's work to disprove the word of God come to the realization and conclusion that it's not false but true. And there's been many who have sought to, who who started off with trying to disprove the word of God that ended up giving their heart to Jesus Christ because God's word is living and powerful and true. So like Ezra, we need to plant our lives, our families, our church on God's word. But With that also, notice how it said that he determined in his heart to study, to follow it, to obey it, to teach it. He determined in his heart. This was not just a hobby of Ezra's, nor was it just a part-time activity. It wasn't something that Ezra would do on the Sabbath or maybe 
on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. No, for Ezra, this was his life's driving focus, his life's driving passion. And so if we're going to follow the example of Ezra, then when it comes to God's word, it should not be something that we just casually take in once in a while. Not something that we're just rooted in on Sundays and Wednesdays, but the other days of the work of the week, well, we got some teaching, we heard some preaching, so we're, we're, we're good to go. No, Ezra lived and breathed the word of God every day. It was his driving passion of his life to know it, to follow it, and to teach it. It was not something he took casually or occasionally. And let me guarantee us this. If God's word we take casually, or if God's word we take occasionally, then we will not be rooted firmly on God's word. It has to be daily. It has to be continually. It has to be something that we do treasure in our heart. As the psalmist said, your word I have treasured in my heart. Do you treasure God's word? Do you hold its value? Does your family center itself on God's word? And do we as a church center on ourselves on the very word of God? Well, how do we treasure it? How do we hold it? How do we make sure that it's not just a part-time, occasional, casual thing? Well, Ezra lays out the path that we need to follow. To study it, to obey it, and to teach it. That's the process of holding God's word in our heart. First of all, study the word. Study the word. Romans 15 verse 4 tells us this. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from scriptures. So everything that was written was here was written to instruct us for life. I remember as a, as a youth, I heard Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. It was a song that one of the Christian groups put out. I don't remember uh, which one. Uh, but that's not why we call it the Bible, but that's a good way of, of looking at it. The Bible is our instructions for how to live, our instructions for life, our instructions for the hope that we have. And so we need to study God's word. We need to hold God's word in our heart. So how do we study God's word and how do we hold it in our heart? H-E-A-R-T. We need to hear the word. It's important to hear it because faith comes by hearing the word of God. Do we hear it? And I'm not talking about just physically hearing, but do we hear it with our heart? Do we listen for it? Are we eager to hear, eager to listen? God, I desire for you to speak. I desire to hear what you have to say to me. Or do we approach it with distracted minds, with only half listening, with, clo with ears that are clogged and ears that, that are closed? We need to hear God's word. Not only do we hear it, but we also need to examine it. For to study the word is not just to briefly read it or, 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 or to casually hear it, but to truly pour in, figure out what's going on there and, and, and what it is that God is doing. Why, why did God give us the book of Ezra? Why did God give us the, the book of Acts? Why in the world did God give us the book of Leviticus? How many people, when they try to read through the Bible in, in a year, you know, get through Genesis and Exodus, all those good stories, and they hit Leviticus and Numbers, and they just dry up. You know, all those names, all those lists, all, all those laws. Let me tell you, there's not one single word that God put in his word that now he says, I don't know why I put that there. Now, all of Scripture is given for us. And so when it comes to something that's hard for us to figure out, when it comes to something like, I, I don't get it, then that's the time to start examining, pouring in. What did this mean to to the original audience as, as the prophet, whether it's Zechariah or whether it's Obadiah, as they were prophesying, what did that mean for Israel when they heard it at the time? And, and how can I apply that to my life uh, now? Um, you know, there's different styles that, that's in the Bible. There's poetry, there's wisdom, there's those lists that I mentioned, geneolo genealogy lists, um, census lists, uh, there's narrative uh, there's all different styles of writing and, and the styles they impact. And so, and so dig in and examine. You know, when you read through the psalm, how often did David talk about just meditating on God's word and studying his word and treasuring, and treasuring God's word? So if we're going to hold God's word in our heart, we have to hear it 
We have to examine it. We have to analyze it. We have to remember it. If all the physical copies, or now digital copies, of God's Word were thrown away, destroyed, deleted, how much of God's Word would you still have with you? You know, one of the disadvantages we have of living in modern society, Western culture, is we're really bad with memorization. I mean, how many of you would say, I'm actually pretty good with memorization, and if you are, that's okay. Anyone? I see one, two hands, three hands. And that's not surprising. Usually in a group like this, you'll get, you'll, get a, you'll get a small handful, but how many of you would say, I'm not really good with memorization? You know, that's the majority. Well, we live in a culture where we really don't need to memorize things. If there's anything you want, you can go look it up, especially with the digital age. You can just pull it up on your smartphone, your tablet. Um, um, and since everything's at our fingertips, well, what need do I have of memorizing it? But unfortunately, we as Christians sometimes take that same thought pattern when it comes to God's Word. Well, I can just pull it up. I can, I can bring it forth on my phone or on my iPad. Um, I can grab it off my shelf. If there's a verse that, that I want, I can turn to the back and, and, and look up you know, something on a subject matter that I'm looking at. I have easy a- access. Why do I need to memorize it? Well, have you ever been in a situation where you needed God's Word or God's Word would have been helpful where you didn't have it with you right at the time? I think we've all been there. And when you hide God's Word in your heart, then what happens? Because God's Word is more than just information. When we memorize God's Word, when we take it in, when we we meditate on God's Word, when when we pour it over in our minds and with our hearts, then it starts shaping who we are. And it's and it starts molding our hearts and molding our minds to follow after God. And so it's not just a good source of information, though there's lots of good information, but it is life transformation. And I can guarantee you this, there is no physical copy or digital copy that can transform life. It's when you bring God's word into your mind, into your heart. After all, Romans uh, 12, 1 and 2 tells us not to be trans- not to be conformed by the world around us, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And how do we do that? By letting God's Word soak in and transform us. So we need to, in a sense, be detectives of God's Word, figuring out everything that it says. You know, when I was a kid, I loved the Sherlock Holmes stories. Anybody else like Sherlock Holmes? Uh, I, I read an interesting encounter one time that uh, the author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, he had when he was on vacation and he was uh, stopped to get a taxi cab. And uh, when he stopped to get a taxi cab, the taxi driver recognized him immediately. You are Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And he was kind of taken aback. Um, he, you know, well, how did, you, how did you know who I am? Have you seen a picture of me before? Did you recognize me? And the driver replied, today's paper had an article about you being on vacation in Marseille. This was in France. This is the taxi stand people from Maasai use. Your skin color tells me you're on vacation. The ink spot on your right index finger suggests that you're an author. Your clothing is English. Adding all this up, I decided that you are indeed Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And he was astonished. He said, you, my friend, are a real-life Sherlock Holmes. And the taxi driver said, and one other thing. Your luggage has your name on it. (laughs) You know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, when he wrote Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes is a great detective, not because he had supernatural ability, but because he was one who studied and analyzed and searched out. And that's the approach we need to take with God's Word, to study it, to to come to know it, more than just mentally, come to know it in our hearts, to dig into it. And as we dig in and as we abide in God's Word, and as we hold His Word in our heart, then man, what a wonderful thing God does with our hearts and, and with our lives. So yes, we need to study the Word. But not only do we need to study the Word, secondly, we need to obey the Word. We need to obey the Word. Because what good does studying God's Word do if you don't live it out? 
You know those Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes that the New Testament always paints in a negative light? They were excellent at studying God's word, but they were horrible at living it out. Which is why Jesus said, listen to what they're saying and do what they say, but don't you dare live as they live. Because they knew the word, but they did not live it out. So if we're going to live out the word, yes, we do have to study it, because how can you live out what you do not know? I have no clue how to change an oil on my car. Thomas, I know you do, but you learned how to do it. If I learned how to do it, then I could do it, but I can't do it because I haven't learned how to do it. Now, I'm guessing it's probably not that difficult, but how can we live out God's word in our life? How can we live out God's will if we don't know it? I know I've shared with you many times before that a very common question people ask is, how can I know God's will in my life? It goes back to that Romans 12, 1 and 2. You know, don't be conformed by the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so then you will know what God's will is, is good, gracious, and pleasing will. When we know God's word, it will lead us in his will. And then we can know what God's will for our lives is. And when we know God's will, and we know God's word, then we'll know what God wants us to do with our lives so that we can obey it and we can live it out. Because if you truly love God, you will hold his word. But more than holding his word, you will live out his word. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14 tells us, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Blessed are those who do his commandments, which means the reverse is true. Those who are not blessed are those who do not do his commandments. It does us no good to study his word if we don't live it out. And Ezra loved God fiercely. And so he, he poured his life into studying the word so he could live it out. But it doesn't stop there. Thirdly, we also need to teach the word. We need to teach the word. There was a pastor in a church who received word that, uh, that the teaching quality in the children's department might not be at the level it should be. So the pastor decided to sit in uh, on, on one of the classes one Sunday morning. And as he was there, the Sunday school class, a teacher, she asked the class, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? And she got just blank stares. So she called on one of the children there, Jimmy, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? And Jimmy said, I don't know, but I didn't do it. The pastor kind of thought that was a little humorous. The teacher was kind of embarrassed since, you know, the, the pastor was there. Um, well, after the class was over, later on, the pastor went to, uh, to the Sunday school director. And he thought, well, I'll share the story with him. And so he said, I, I was sitting in class, and uh, the teacher asked Jimmy who knocked down the walls of Jericho. And Jimmy said, well, I don't know. I didn't do it. And the Sunday school director said, well, pastor, I can tell you this. I know Jimmy, and if Jimmy says he didn't do it, then he didn't do it. The pastor then knew, well, I think we have a little deeper issue, issue going on. So he was sitting, sitting down with the other pastors uh, of the church uh, at a meeting and with, um, um, uh, with the elders and, and the finance committee and uh, as they were together. And starting off the meeting, he thought he would share the story with them all. Uh, how the, you know, who knocked down the walls of Jericho? I, I don't know. I, I didn't do it. And so um, as he shared that story, then those that were with him started talking and discussing. And so they finally came to a conclusion. They said, Pastor, well, whether it was Jimmy or not, we can get the treasure. We can authorize a check to whatever the cost is for the wall of Jericho. Let us know and we'll cover it. I wonder, do we really teach the word of God? Teaching God's word is more than just sharing the familiar Bible stories. Though definitely that's vital. But teaching God's word is teaching how God's word is that living and active. It's that discipleship process. As one person once said, it's one beggar showing another beggar how to get bread. 
if we truly know God's word and we live it out, then why would we not share it with those that are around us? Because if we know God's word and we live it out, then we know the blessings that that is. We know how it guides us and it helps us. We know how it instructs us how to live and how to communicate the gospel to those around us. We know the wonderful thing that it is to have God's word in our heart. Why would we not want to live it out? Ezra knew that God's word was not just for him alone, for him to to study and to live, but hold on and not to share it. He knew that God's word was to give, to teach. After all, the great commission that's been given to us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, what did Jesus say? He said, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which, by the way, we as Baptists, we're all about that. We need to be on mission. We need to go. We need to preach God's word everywhere. We need to baptize those who come to the faith. But so often we forget verse 20 that comes right next, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus did not call us to make converts, but to make disciples. And that happens, yes, through evangelism, but with discipleship and with teaching. Now you might say, well, I'm not the best teacher. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. I'm not the pastor. But the Great Commission was given to who? Every Christian. Is everyone called to be a pastor? No. Is everyone in our church supposed to be a Sunday school teacher? Well, if we're all teaching Sunday school, then who would be, you know, the the student? No, we're not supposed to all have that same role. Now, I would probably say all of us should be at the point in our Christian life where we, or should grow to the point in our Christian life to where we could teach Sunday school. But we are all called, no matter what our roles or functions, not what we are equipped for, what our talents, what our personality is for, all of us are called to go, but to also teach. Now you might say, man, that person over there has so much more biblical knowledge than I do. But teaching is not about biblical knowledge. It's about your relationship with Christ. And if you know what God has done in your life, and if you're in his word learning, there are things that you can share and things that you can teach. Parents, how many of you have had a child that has taught you something? Parents, you better be raising your hand. You know, you don't have to have the most knowledge to be able to teach. So how do we build, how do we renovate? We hold God's word in our heart by studying, obeying, teaching. Because the truth of the matter is, we cannot build our lives. You cannot build your family. We cannot build our church if we are not holding God's word in our heart. And then a second thing I want to share with you real quickly this morning is this. Yes, we hold God's word in our heart, but we also trust our heart in God's hand. Trust your heart in God's hand. Notice with Ezra, as he was determined to go to Jerusalem because he knew there was spiritual apathy. He knew the excitement and the passion and the commitment had dwindled. He had a passion to go, to continue to learn God's word, to continue to live it out, but then teach it to Israel so the nation could flourish. Not just talking about the physical building now, but the spiritual building of the nation. He decided to go there, and because of his love for God, because he gave his heart to God, he knew he could trust his heart and his life in God's hand. And see what God did in verse 6 and verse 9. It says this, The king had granted him everything he requested. Why? Because the hand of the Lord his God was on him. And then in verse 9, he began his journey from Babylon on the first day of the first month. He arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. The gracious hand of his God was on him. Twice there in these short ten verses, it tells us that the hand of God was on him. By the way, that phrase will appear four more times in this chapter and the next chapter. God's hand was upon Ezra because Ezra trusted his heart with God. And let me tell you, it's a great thing to be under the hand of God. You see, God directed the heart of Artaxerxes to grant Ezra's request. 
And God safely brought Ezra and guided him by his hand to Israel. Why? Because Ezra determined in his heart, God, I'm going to live holy for you by knowing you and by making you known. And so he trusted in God's hand. And when we are living in God's hand, man, what a great place to be. Because God's hand is a hand of providence. It's a hand of protection. It's a hand of provision. It's a hand of guidance. In Exodus 9.3, it tells us that when God brought his people out from slavery and brought them to the promised land, it was by his hand. When the Israelites had wandered through the wilderness and when God parted the parted the waters of Jericho for them to to enter in under the leadership of Joshua. God parted those waters by his hand. The exiles who returned under Cyrus, there is a prophecy in Isaiah telling exactly what would happen. And it said that it would happen by God's hand. God's hand is all throughout Scripture. God's hand moves history. God's hand guides his people. God's hand provides for his people. If you are in God's hand, that is the best place that you can be. Out of God's hand is the worst place that you can be. One of my favorite stories I share all the time is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who would ever think that they could be more safe inside a blazing, fiery furnace than outside? But you know why they were more safe? Because they were in God's hand. And I'm not just talking about physical safety, because there are there Christians who live in God's hand, who lose their life for the cause of the kingdom? Most definitely. But do they lose eternity? What did I share with the kids when we are in God's hand? Who can snatch us out? No one. No one. He holds us securely, and he holds us tightly. And if we trust in his hand, he will guide us and lead us and provide for us and equip us to carry out the task that he has called us to do, to bring Christ to those who do not know him, to proclaim the gospel to every nation. Because one day, surrounding the throne of Jesus Christ in heaven, There will be men and women from every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. And I don't know about you, but wouldn't it be a good thing to have more people up there and less people down there? And we can accomplish that when we are secure and trusting in his hand. We see his hand at play not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 11, verse 19 through 21, Scripture tells us this. Those who had been scattered... The early church, there was persecution in Jerusalem, and they were scattered. So those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen, the first martyr, made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, speaking the message to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, Cypriot and Cyrenian, men who came to Antioch, a Gentile place, non-Jews, and they began speaking to the Hellenists, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. And then watch what happens. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Acts is the most exciting book in Scripture because the gospel is being pushed further and further. The church is a wildfire that is blazing and spreading to new lands, to new peoples. Whether it's through Paul and his missionary journeys, or whether it's through the men in the scripture that we read, the church is just spreading and it's going. Why? Because the hand of God is leading it and guiding it. And they're proclaiming the name of Jesus, trusting their lives in the very hands of God. God, I know that you will keep us safe here on earth as long as it is your will for us to be here. But even if we die, even if we are persecuted, even if we are rejected, we are still safe in your hand. And we will trust in your hand in our life. After all, God is the architect, is he not? He is the builder. We're talking about building our lives, our family, and our church. He is the architect. He is the master builder. And he will never build your life wrong. He will never build your family wrong. He will never build our church wrong. We get flaws in our building structures when we get out of God's hand and rely on our own hands. 
Because he is the architect, he sees the vision for your life. He sees the pathway for your family. And he sees the mission for his church. And so he can guide us and he can build us to accomplish what he wants us to do. Years ago, there was a pastor named Samuel. Like many, he followed God's call into ministry. And there were some who just did not like him. Even in his own church, he had those who were just sworn to be his enemies. For some reason or other, they had just stopped paying attention to God and let Satan get a hold of their lives. But Pastor Samuel had a tremendous sense of God's providence, of God's guiding hand on his life. So he would not let himself get discouraged by those who try to discourage him. He would not let himself stop by those who wanted him to stop. He said, God, I'm trusting in your hand to lead and to guide, and I will continue trusting in your hand. Even when things got so bad that members of his church set fire to his parsonage to get him to leave, to discourage him, they set fire. Now, let me just pause by saying this. I would hope that if any of you have issues with me, fire would not be your first approach. But they set fire to his parsonage. By the way, he had eight children, and one of his children was trapped in the top story. And when the fire broke out, Samuel was desperate to get his son out. He had good neighbors, and they were able to rescue his son. And when he was able to gather his children safely in front of his house, which was burning to ashes, he said, come neighbors, let us kneel down, let us give thanks to God. He has given me all my eight children. Let the house go. I am rich enough. He continued pastoring that church for 40 years, with physically very little to show for it, except for his family, including that one boy, who he liked to refer to as Amos 4.11 says, a brand plucked out of the fire. A boy by the name of John Wesley, who if you're familiar with him, became one of the greatest ministers in history. Under his ministry, there were millions that came to faith in Jesus Christ. But let me ask you this question. As Samuel was watching that house burn, do you think he was thinking... Well, everything's going to be okay because John's going to grow up to be a minister who will save millions? No. He didn't know what the end result could be. He didn't know where God's hand would guide and where God's hand was, would lead. He didn't know the end of the story, but he did know the author of the story. He knew the master architect and the master builder. And despite what's going on in my life, I'm trusting in God. So I will continue to build. I will continue to hold his word in my heart. And I will continue to trust my heart in his hand. Do you see how powerful it can be to trust in God's hand? Because when we trust in his hand, then it frees us to build as he calls us to build. It frees us to go, to proclaim, to teach to know Christ, and to make him known. So will you trust your heart in the hand of God? And will you hold his word in your heart? Let's pray. Father God, as we come before you this morning, Father, I know that it is our human nature, that fallen sinful nature, that pulls us away from you and causes our hearts to grow cold, our passion to dry up, our hunger and thirst for your will and for your word to dissipate. God, it's unfortunately so easy for us to grow or stop growing and become just like the world around us. God, we all are here this morning and we desperately need your word in our lives. God, we need you to build 
our lives and our families on you, Jesus Christ. We need your strength to empower us, your word to motivate us, your spirit to guide us. God, there may be a person here this morning who has never trusted their heart in your hand. God, I pray if there's such a person here, yes, they might have biblical knowledge, but they have never surrendered their life to you. God, I pray this morning that that person will finally stop trying to build their lives on their own and trust their life in your hand. God, and for those of us who are your children, God, I would say most of us, if not all of us, need renovation done in our hearts. God, for you to stoke the fires, to build the flame, not of emotions, but of commitment and passion and desire. To know you more and more, to follow you, and to make you known to this world that is dying without you. God, forgive us for growing cold. Forgive us for abandoning your word or just holding it occasionally and casually. Forgive us for not trusting in your hand. And God, may we trust in you as you build, as you renovate. Because God, you are building a glorious kingdom that can never be conquered and will never be destroyed. And a kingdom that is everlasting with no end, with joy and hope and peace forever. So God, as you are building, may we join you in following your leadership, trusting in you to equip and to guide, and all the while knowing, God, that we are safe in your hand. We thank you, God, for your hand. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.